Okay, hi everyone, welcome to the channel. Uh, it's Young Money Talk Interviews. This will be the first of many of a mind body series uh, where we're just all going to be focused on the mind body connection. I'm so excited to have Sherelle here with us today. She has a YouTube called Sherelle Thinks. It has almost 20,000 subscribers now, which is crazy. Um, but she also coaches people one on one with health anxiety. Uh, her goal is to get people just back to normalcy and living their lives in, uh, with joy. And uh, she's also experienced many somatic symptoms with health anxiety and also just anxiety in general. And one of them kind of made her famous for a while, and that's the one we're going to focus on today. Uh, it's called aquagenic urticaria. So she actually became allergic to water, which is a thing. And we're just going to ask her all about it. So uh, hi, Cheryl. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm excited to do this interview with you. Yeah, me too. I think people are going to get a lot of value from it, especially if anybody with, who currently has aquagenic urticaria watches this. Um, but even for the others, just to kind of spread awareness of this kind of stuff and let them know that uh, they can get better. Yeah. Um, so I know you have a lot of gems for us today. Um, I want to come out and start the interview by just saying that at least in your case, and I'm sure in others, that uh, being allergic to water, aquagenic or Takari, it's psychosomatic. Yeah. So, at, you know, I can't speak for all cases, but in your case, for sure, and I'm sure there's others as well. So our first question is going to be, what is psychosomatic and uh, what does that mean to you? Well, I mean, for me, it's um, any condition or any set of symptoms that is manifested by the brain. So it's I think people have this perception when you say psychosomatic that it's not real, right? And I think that's categorically wrong. Um, it is real. It's just your brain is sending incorrect signals to your body and that can cause almost any symptom. I mean, it can be... Somatic symptoms can be severe. People are, are paralyzed in a wheelchair and it's coming from their brain. So I think, yeah, it's important to remember that psychosomatic illness and, and the symptoms that people get can be life change I mean for me it was um I don't think we fully understand it yet and I think that in the future and there's loads of studies coming out now um a ton of studies actually just showing and demonstrating that this is a real thing and I think people are especially doctors and physicians are starting to really understand that because I think a lot of people will be like oh that's not that's not a thing but I think that maybe for a lot of illnesses take like fibromyalgia as an example um, I think a lot of these things are psychosomatic, so that's my that's my thoughts anyway. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. So it's not all in your head. No. Right. I mean, okay. yeah, I don't. It's it's a weird one, you know. I don't fully understand it myself yet. Okay. Yeah. So um, for those of you who are just new to this topic, so psychosomatic is not all in your head. It's created in the brain, and it becomes real in the body. So the brain. Um, either directly create symptoms. So there's a few ways it happens. One way is it directly intentionally creates a specific symptom on purpose. And this can happen like maybe you read about something, a symptom, and then it happens. Well, you now know like your brain purposely directly chose that symptom that you just read about. On the other hand, there's, uh, which I think is the case in aquagenic or tachycardia, there's the case where the nervous system is just really on edge and when that happens, certain autonomic functions, and autonomic functions are things like breathing, heart rate, um, when you put your hand in water and, your and then you have those wrinkles on your finger. Those are all things that your body does automatically. So those autonomic functions become really altered when somebody is suffering with anxiety. It just changes everything. The whole, your autonomic uh, nervous system is not functioning as well as it can be. And because of that, I think things go out of whack. And it also affects things like blood cells and, and all that as far as the things that I've read so far. Um, those are all the different things that can be affected by it. Um, so I do want to let anybody suffering with either like aquagenic or tachycardia or anything psychosomatic. It's not all in your head. You're not imagining it. That would be hysterical symptoms, which are a thing too. Some people do have hysteric symptoms, but that's not the focus of this interview uh, or even the, all the interviews that we're going to have on this podcast. Um, so Sherelle... Why don't you go ahead and tell us about how the water allergy started for you? Like, and give us all the details. We want all of it. Uh, <laughs> you want you all know, the juice, it, yeah. We want the beginning as it happened. Yeah, all of it, all of it. 
Oh my goodness. It always makes me laugh and smirk. I don't know why, because it, it just it sounds so ridiculous to even say, but I'll tell you the story. So um, I, I will say that um, throughout my life, I haven't really had any major allergies, anything like that. So it's not like, you know, this is a like common for me. But um, when I was pregnant with my firstborn, she's four now, so this was like five years ago, um, my mental health really took a plunge in like the last trimester of the pregnancy. And I was really struggling and I was always like in, in uh, like um, in, in the hospital getting checks and just being really paranoid. So my anxiety was like real high. Um, and then when I gave birth to my daughter, the experience, the birth in itself was like deeply traumatic. It was like really rough. I was in labor for 36 hours in excruciating pain, as you can imagine. Um, and so, yeah, my stress levels were very high. So I was in the hospital and I didn't shower for like the first two days because I was like bed bound and whatever. But then when I got home with my baby, I got in the shower and broke out in like angry hives from like head to toe and so obviously the first thing that you think is like hey I've just given birth right so like maybe it's some kind of reaction and whatever but then it kind of kept happening like each day I was showering I was breaking out in these hives so this was the start of like this huge elimination process that drove me insane because I was like right well maybe my hormones have changed and maybe now I'm allergic to like my soap right so you you do the logical things and I'm a logical person for the most part so like I changed my soap, it wasn't that. Then I'm thinking, right, okay, maybe it's like the temperature of the water, right? Maybe my skin can't handle the heat anymore. So I played around with the temperatures, it wasn't that. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's like line scale or mold in my shower head or something. And now I can't tolerate it if I bought a new shower head. <laughs> it wasn't uh. that. So then it was like, you know, so I was like, maybe it's like something in the water. Like, you know, maybe there's like the chlorine or there's something in there. So then I kind of like, moved away from the shower and I was like okay well I wonder how I would react like going in the sea right or like going in a swimming pool and um, still reacting so I'm like what like this is like making no sense what is it it's got to be something so I was like it can't be water that makes no sense like no one's no one's allergic to water right so I then kind of like <laughs> I bought bottled water still happened spring water and at this point after the spring water one I googled like allergic to water and then at mm. acrogenic urticaria came up and I was like Okay, started reading, and I was like, this, this this cannot be real. Surely there's, like, like 25 cases reported, like, in medical literature. So it's, like, exceptionally rare. But I still didn't believe it. I was like, no way, like, that can't be me. Like, I, I cannot have this. But um, my kind of realisation came when I bought myself some reverse osmosis water, which has nothing in it. Like, it's, like, the purest of purest water. And I poured it all over myself. And my mum and dad were waiting outside the, the bathroom door because it was like this huge moment for us kind of thing. And I poured it all over myself. I went downstairs, my mum gave me a cup of tea and I was waiting for the reaction and the reaction came. So my mum and dad were like scratching their heads saying like, what, like this, what is this? So um, I then basically went to see my GP and my GP basically laughed me out the door and was like, you're not allergic to water. There's no way, like, and I was like, I'm, he was like, it must be the temperature of the water. And I was like, dude, I'm telling you, I have done it at every single degree because I'm obsessive like this. Like, I wouldn't mess around. Like, I've done it at, like, body temperature. Like, I, you can imagine. Like, I did it all, right? Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm not even bothering with this guy. So I basically paid privately to see an immunologist um, slash allergist. And I went in to see him with, like, a folder, right? So I had, like, all photos. I had, like, screenshots of, like... Um, you know, documents on the internet. I had like everything written down. He literally like did an allergy test, poured water on my skin, looked at me, was like, you have acrogenic urticaria. And I was like, <gasps> dun, dun, dun. So I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember leaving that appointment like morbidly depressed thinking like, what do I do? I can't, I can't, I can't ever go swimming again. I can't go in the sea. Like, is this allergy going to kill me? Like I was really, I didn't know how bad it was back then. And I was thinking, how am I ever, like I used to have like three baths a day. Like, I just did that was my thing and like then I suddenly had to have like three minute showers because it was like super itchy and painful and yeah and then so I, I like made the mistake of like thinking like I should probably spread awareness so I um I got in contact with like Daily Mail <laughs> that, that took my story and like ran with it and was like she can't even drink and and it just like yeah, and anyway, I, I ended up finding, like, a Facebook group for it. And it turns out that there is more people than, you know, than uh, than the internet says. On this group, there was about 400 people. Okay, okay. 
Uh, it wow. probably maybe affects more than that. I think that most 400 people, maybe people on this internet group. Yeah. Yes. And do you think they all? Do you think they all actually had it? I mean, here's the thing. So there's something called chlorogenic <clears throat> urticaria, which is um, heat. So some people will say on the group, "Oh, but it only happens with like hot water," and I'm like, "You're in the wrong group. This is this is not temperature related." And some people say, "Oh, it okay. only happens with cold water," and there's there's a cold um, urticaria okay. as well. Uh, there's also so that's a probably pressure with one. the. Oh, so okay. So there's there's some where they have like a water allergy, but it's only. It's dependent on other factors, not water by itself. Right. Whereas a pure aquagenic urticaria, it doesn't matter the temperature, the pressure. No, nothing, none of okay. that matters. So they, that's why it's a lot more rare. Because a lot of people will um, break out in hives from heat, you know, and that's quite a common condition. And, you know, and there's even one that is like, I think it's called solar urticaria, which is from the sun, you know. So there, there are these weird, freaky I've seen that allergies. Before. Yeah. I've seen the solar, which... I believe it's psychosomatic too. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop you as far as your story because I want to touch on a few things. Okay. Um, so far, it's like, wow. Uh, a story already. Okay, so it first happened, if I heard correctly, when you came back from giving birth. Yeah. The, like literally the first shower, first shower that you took. The very first shower you took after, after giving birth, you broke out in hives from the water, freaked you out. You started, um, become, you pretty much became a scientist trying to figure out what it was that was wrong with you. Um, and when you did say mold, so mold is like, I'm so glad you said that because everybody goes down the mold uh, rabbit hole. Do. Yeah. Everybody goes after, down the mold rabbit hole. And you know, I don't know enough about mold yet to really say, like to have an opinion yet. But I'm going to say like, I, I do think that a lot of the times I don't think mold is the problem. Uh, especially, but, um, you know, I'm going to go off topic a little bit because I think it's, it's important to touch on the mold thing. Um, I think getting better from all of, a lot of illness is about making ourselves stronger and better able to handle the, the, the um, our environment. Yeah. So a lot of people always want to leave the environment. Oh, and this is so good because we're going to talk about your exposure process. Um, which is a part of getting better. So a lot of people want to remove themselves from the environment or fix the environment instead of making themselves stronger. When you're stronger, you can handle more toxins. Your body is able to, to handle more stressors. Um, so with the mold thing, uh, I, I mean, everybody's been down. I've seen it so many times in like the TMS forum and the conversations I've had with other people in interviews I've heard of other people who've overcame mind body things. They're like, oh yeah, I, I thought it was mold. And a lot of people, they do handle the mold, and then they still ha are in pain. Yeah. So a lot of times, it's um, not that. And then um, the other thing I just want to like emphasize is that you, you pretty much like did all you could physically first. Yeah. Because that's where our mind first goes when we have symptoms, right? So it's like, okay, I have these hives. What touched me? What outside of my body touched my body and making it react this way? Yeah. Um, so I wanted I wanted to touch on that as well. And then uh, you did mention uh, how rare the the condition aquagenic urticaria is. I did actually do some research from the NIH uh, website, and they actually have a rare and genetic disease um, registry, and it's on there. And so it says aquagenic urticaria is a rare condition in which um, the skin uh, or hives develop rapidly after the skin comes in contact with water regardless of its temperature. So you said that. It most commonly affects women. Very interesting. Uh, very common with psychosomatic things. Some of them do discriminate a lot towards women. Uh, it, so it most commonly affects women and symptoms often start around onset of puberty. Interesting. The exact underlying cause is unknown due to the rarity of the condition. There's limited data regarding the effectiveness of individual treatment. However, various medications and therapies have been used with variable success. And uh, the symptoms, it says right here, wheels that are one to three millimeters. Uh, they can be red or skin colored. The rash commonly develops in the neck, trunk, arms, although it can occur anywhere in the body. Um, so it looks like they don't know what causes it. They don't have any treatments for it, at least that are effective, um, which... 
I want to hear all about your kind of med medical merry-go-round because I'm sure you had one. Um, so, but go ahead and continue uh, on your story. So you were talking about a forum that you joined. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, one more thing, one more thing before we move on to that. Your GP. So your GP like totally just dismissed your symptoms, which is so wrong. Yeah. And it's so common with these issues uh, because of how, especially the more rare ones, and I think he ha he thought that you had the other form. Like, oh, it must be the temperature and all that. And I've experienced that myself. Like, I've experienced a symptom where, like, my skin would turn red if I wore, um, like, sandals that were too tight. It was only for a little bit. But I had seen this dermatologist, and she was like, oh, your sandals were too tight. I'm like, I wear these, I wear these sandals, like, a thousand times. And she's like, no, it's your sandals. It's your sandals. <laughs> I was like, are you serious? Like... I don't, I don't get some of these physicians. Um, but anyway, so go ahead and continue on with your story. Yeah, so I, when I joined, you know, the, the group, that was reassuring, you know, to me. And there was, there was people on there with, uh, with their stories. But one thing I noticed was that everybody was highly anxious. <laughs> and, like, people were like, you know, oh, I'm not, I'm not anxious. And I was like, you are, like, anxious. And, uh, you know, there, there, was no, there were no success stories, none. Um, in fact, everyone was just like, it's getting worse. Like, this is like ruining my life. There was a couple of people genuinely like suicidal over it. So for me, as you can imagine, I, I joined that group and I was like, well, this is my life now. Great. You know, this is awful. Um, so yeah. And, and I mean, what I did then with the immunologist that I paid privately to see, I, I sort of said like, what can I, what can I do? You know? And he didn't really have any options. He said, you know, we can we can put you on a super high dose of like antihistamines. So like here in the UK, one of the strongest antihistamines that you can get is called fexofenadine. And uh, for most adults, you could only take 180 milligrams a day. Um, but he was allowing me to take five a day because like, you know, he was like, I'm gonna, he was like, only I can like prescribe you this. But I am like a tiny person and they made me feel awful. So... I didn't really get on with that. I did go down to like three a day, but it wasn't doing anything at all. I tried all of the over-counter kind of like antihistamines. Um, that didn't work. I tried some like barrier creams that you can like put on, but I didn't understand the concept of the barrier creams because then I didn't feel like I was clean. Like you put a cream on to get in the shower. Like it just, and I was like, it just didn't make sense to me. So yeah, I, I didn't really did, like those. Did it work though? Like did the water, like would it kind of like roll off? Your, um, I would imagine it's kind of like suns, like waterproof sunscreen kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, so like a thick, 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 like a thick, yeah, like a shiny. Yeah. yeah, it did work a little bit. Um, it wasn't like foolproof, but it, it was okay. But again, it just like I wasn't. If you can't scrub yourself, I don't know. Like you're not getting to your skin, right? So what's the point of showering if you? I don't know. It just felt weird to me. No, um, I totally get it. So I yeah I I I did I did that um and and then eventually I just was like, I'm gonna have to limit myself to like two to three minute showers. And then like, I went through a phase of being terrified of getting caught in the rain, like terrified. And like, I would like have like these big umbrellas with me like everywhere. And like, even if I was, even if it was like a sunny day, because I was like, what if it starts torrential raining and I break out in public? So for me, it, like it, it didn't just affect like my shower time, but it affected me in the sense of like, I was like scared constantly of like, you know, being out and getting rained on or, you know, like if I was playing with my daughter or something like outside and she was like, I don't know, like I was just like, don't throw water on mummy, <laughs> you know, like bath in here and stuff, you know, I would bath her and put my arms in the water and then I'd have like, you know, all hives on my arms. So it was just, it was so problematic to me, like, and so, um, so scary because I was reading stories on the group of women saying like I can't drink it anymore now I know that's bullshit now from from kind of doing my research and whatever and I went through a phase where I felt like I couldn't drink it but that was one million percent in my mind I had therapy for it because when I was drinking water I felt like my throat was closing now here's the thing aquagenic urticaria does not doesn't do that because the skin cells and the cells in your throat are completely different to your skin cells right it, it's, it's bullshit, it doesn't make sense. So my mind, because I told myself I can't drink water, I was like drinking, like suffocating, and my therapist was like, you can drink the water, like you can. So I did exposure therapy for that, and of course I could drink the water, it was just for my drinking mind. the water? Yeah. Okay, wow, okay, so exposure therapy just for drinking the water. water. Um, right. What about your lips if you drink water? Would that be affected? No, your face, uh, the, the face is um, not really affected. Um, Mostly, it was mostly for me 
neck to like belly button area. Um, okay, so tears would. Not unless they dropped on my chest, really. Um, but I did see some people on the group that would would have um, facial involvement. But I was quite lucky in that sense. So I could put like a big jumper on and nobody would like see. So I was one of the luckier ones in that sense. But it never really affected my legs. And the only time it affected my legs was the first reaction when it was like head to toe. Um, okay. So. so the people on the on the forum. Would they kind of just shut the the ones who got really bad and like were suicidal? Was it the symptoms themselves that are that terrible, or was it the symptoms plus just like their own fear and anxieties about the future, and, and stuff like that? So a lot like, are of the symptoms life changing enough to like drive someone to that by themselves? Do you think, or do you think it, it would have to be like fear, anxiety plus the symptoms? Yeah. So here's my like, and you know, people might hate me for this, but I'm gonna say anyway. Like for me. Like, I don't, yes, you itch when you get out of the shower and you get some hives, but um, we'll, we'll lead on to this, I'm sure. But like, I got to a point where I'd be like, do you know what? Fuck this. I'd, I'd take my 20 minute shower. I'd put a dressing gown on and I'd go and sit there and have a cup of tea and think, oh, well, I'm itchy, you know? But initially, it's 100% the fear. It's the, it's the, it's the what if thinking, because for me, the stress and the anxiety of it was the worst part. Not the fact that I was breaking out in hives because I was itchy. It was me thinking like, oh my God, I can't live like this. I'm never going to be able to do this. What if I can't do it? What if this? What if that? What if this? What if that? That was like the problematic. And when I used to see people on that group, it was basically those what if thoughts. It was like people were struggling with They were like, I can't do this forever. You know, what if I can't ever go in the sea again? What if this? not a lot of people were actually like saying that like you know the condition itself was life changing it was more the worries for the future if you know what i mean so that's what i noticed yeah, yeah. well i think it's really good it only also no allergies good but at least it only affected your skin right because imagine if you couldn't drink water like then it becomes a life-threatening issue well there was um, a woman in the newspaper this is the thing there was a woman in the uk newspapers just like me a couple of years before me with the exact same allergy, except for hers was like, she was saying that she could not drink it, that she had to live on Coke, like Coca-Cola, uh, that she couldn't even eat like watermelon and stuff. And I, I believe that she has aquagenic urticaria. And I believe that she convinced herself that she couldn't drink it. Right, because why would she be able to drink Coke? I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> like, if you can't, I, if you can drink Coke, you can eat the watermelon. You know, right. unless there's a special ingredient in the Coke that cures aquagenic urticaria or somehow makes it, it um, yeah, like makes it better, you know, that's very <laughs> interesting that though, because yeah, it, the body doesn't work that way. No. Like there's water in Coca-Cola. It's the main solvent. Like there's um, water in everything. There's no way that she'd be <laughs> able to eat. And she was like, you know, if I cry, it could kill me. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like when I laugh, it's not like out of. I laugh because it's like these, it's, it's suffering for nothing and it's totally reversible. Yeah. Um, it's not a lack of empathy, you know, like, and honestly, that lady, she's in a really bad place mentally. Um, yeah, she and was. she needs help. Yeah. And she needs help. And you know, it's not, it's not like all the sufferers fault when people get like that. Mm. Uh, people go to these forums in the first place because they're not getting help right. from their doctors, from the people around them. Right. So when you're when you're pretty much left high and dry from like the medical system, you're going to try and get help anywhere, anywhere. And then you go on these forums and then you like you, you go for support and then you're left even more scared, more worried, more isolated. Um, and it it can lead you to a really dark place. And I've been there. Yeah, I know you've been there. So uh, to anybody watching this, like I totally get why people get that way and i laugh about it now but believe me like, oh, when when you're I was in it. It. yeah but believe me like when you're in it i would have never imagined myself like being able to laugh about this or talk about this in a in a good light um because yeah i mean who likes the idea of being allergic to water forever not being able to go swimming not you know and thinking of it of it getting worse was that like a thing that people would say on the forums too that it progresses and it gets worse yeah, yeah, and and also I want to say, you know, 
it's also not a lack of empathy from, from my perspective. It, I, because like you, I, I know what it's like when you, when you convince yourself of something, right? Like we, we've both been there. Um, I think that, but here's the thing, and this is without sounding judgmental, right? Some people, and I say this with love, almost go into this victim mode, right? And this victim mentality. And I saw a lot oh, of no, that in the group. Yeah, I, yeah. And, and these people didn't really want help. Is that what I gathered? Because I was oh, okay, okay. sort of like doing the research and I was sort of learning that this might be uh, psychosomatic. And when I was putting myself out there and saying like, hey guys, like, what are your thoughts on this? I was kind of getting attacked on the group, you know, because these people, <laughs> they, they wanted to believe that it was physical because of course then if they believed that it was physical, it almost wasn't their fault. And it wasn't their fault anyway, but... I think people can deal with it a little bit better if they think they've just got this really rare, rare condition. They were super unfortunate rather than like, I have sort of done this to myself, you know? And so when that woman was in the newspaper and it was very much like, oh, I, you know, tears could kill me and whatever. I'm sure, I mean, I'd like to think she may have been doing it for the money, whatever, but I'd like to think that she genuinely felt that way. Um, but yeah, these people just did not want um, help and they didn't want to broaden their minds and think maybe this is something that like I can fix you know um so it was it was tough for me because I I was kind of like the outcast of the group because I was here like my body let's let's explore this and they were just like no and um, so I did leave the group eventually because it just wasn't helpful to me okay wow yeah uh I wanted to say like on the topic of victim like I did feel like a victim but yeah. I never got to the point where I just didn't want to be helped like it was always to get help yeah um and I, I would see that like on different forums that I was a part of a few years ago where like some people they just wanted to go there and like complain yeah. and they weren't really looking for solutions and if you offered them a solution they would kind of just tear you down um and it's interesting that you went back and you kind of shared with them, which I want to touch on um, in the like later on in this interview. But um, wow, so the fear, the fear being worse than the symptoms, then is is what you would say for aquagenic urticaria, right? I think so. I really do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and. You know, I totally relate to that because I got to a point too where I was like, some, some, some of these symptoms are not bad. Like they're not that bad for me to like stop my whole life over, you know? Right. Uh, however, on the other hand, I've experienced symptoms that are like they're completely life altering yeah. symptoms. Um, so, but the fear, I mean, the fear, it just paralyzes people. It, it, it can really drive you to a, to a dark place where you don't even want to be alive anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's when you need to get help or you need to help yourself in any way, yeah. shape, or form. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's lacking in, it's lacking in the medical community. It's lacking in the general community because, yeah. you know, generally you're not going to find a lot of empathy, um, which I, I'm going to ask you about as well. Um, but that's the whole goal of, of what I'm doing here and what you're doing here is to be that resource for people. You know, when their doctor has, like, no answers for them. Yeah. Like, just because your doctor doesn't have the answer doesn't mean there's no answer. Um, and even if you have to find it on your own, you know, it's out there. And there are doctors you start to find that, that actually can help you. But there's so little of them that it seems like they don't exist. You know, this psychosomatic stuff, it seems like it doesn't exist because not a lot of people believe it. Yeah. Um, so, Sherelle... You're on the forums. People are saying it's going to get worse. You're seeing the fear the, and all of that. You're, you're feeling it yourself. So what happened at this point as time went on? So this was, yeah, this was like a dark time for me because not only was I dealing with, um, with this condition, but that's where my health anxiety started. And, you know, what... The, the problematic thing was that, like, if I thought, if I convinced myself I had, like, a brain tumor or whatever, and the odds were, like, one in, like, I don't know, 20,000, that was, like, nothing to me, right? Because I was suddenly, like, one in, like, 23 million. So statistics meant nothing to me, so I wasn't able to calm myself down over other issues. Because people say, oh, that's so rare. And I'm like, but I'm the, I'm the girl with the water allergy, so, like, if I, I, like, 
you can't tell me that like I'm like an exception right so it made my health anxiety a lot worse um and I threw myself into raising awareness I did interviews I did documentaries I did I was in the newspaper I got I got this tattoo um it's like a little um umbrella with like a water drop and like it, it's quite nice because a lot of us ended up getting that tattoo um i think there's like 20 of us that have that now um and that's in something that i started in the, in the no in the group in the uh in the group oh, okay so i posted it and i was like i've had this tattoo as a you know as a symbol and, and like everyone was posting their own little ones which was nice um so yeah i mean i i just was in fear as i said all the time and then um this went on for maybe a year and then um i got to a point where i just became fed up right so i would just i just used to get in 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 the shower regardless and i would just as i said i'd put my dressing gown on like and tie it really tight so that i couldn't feel the reaction as such and i would distract myself instantly so i would like go and play with my daughter make myself a cup of tea go out the garden because the reaction would only last about about 30 to 45 minutes so as long as i kept myself busy for that time I just used to say to myself, this will go away. And I used to sort of like repeatedly tell myself that. And then um, I was doing a lot of research about it. And, you know, the reason why, well, there was a theory as to why it's mostly women and mostly women around puberty is hormones, right? Now, that made sense to me because I had just given birth when it first happened. And um, I then started to read of women who... It had ha- it started when they had their baby, and then when they had a second baby, it went away, right? So um, I I then, I think it was maybe when my daughter was like 18 months old, I got pregnant. And um, not, it wasn't because I wanted to like cure my allergy or anything, I just got pregnant naturally. Um, and whilst I was pregnant, um, I will say that pregnancy sadly um, wasn't viable. I, I, it, I had a miscarriage like eight weeks, but whilst I was pregnant, it went away, right? So that confused me. And I was like, yeah. And I, you know, I was like, I don't get it. But then I knew, here's the thing, right? I didn't know whether it genuinely was the hormones or because people had told me, oh, when I was pregnant the second time, it went away. So I I was like Mm. conflicted, right? I didn't know whether, which one it was. Um, Anyway, I did then go on to have another baby, my little boy River, who's now two, uh, well, almost two and a half. And when I gave birth to him, it went away. Like, completely went away, right? Um, When you gave birth to him? So, like, after you gave birth to him, it went away? It went away. Okay, let's stop here, because this is a good stopping point. (laughs) Um, Okay, so a few things. So when you were in the garden and you kept like trying to tell yourself like, okay, you're okay, it's gonna be okay. Did you know about psychosomatic like theories and stuff at the time, or you would just tell yourself this to make yourself feel better? Like you knew that the the power of positive thinking or whatever. Like why would you tell yourself that? What? I what was the I don't know. I just think it. I just found it comforting. I mean, I had I had read a little bit about some you know psychosomatic stuff, but. But I was still early days, you know. I, I still didn't believe it. I didn't believe it could be real. Okay, you know? so you kind of knew about it at the time, kind sort of, of, but yeah. you didn't believe it, and you also weren't like as knowledgeable as now. No, no way. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And then time went by. You had your baby, and it went away. It went away. Okay, continue. Yeah, so it went away, um, and it went away for. I just forgot, at this point, I forgot about it, right? Because I also, like, <laughs> lost my mind for other reasons. And, you know, you, you know that story. That was a that was the health anxiety stuff. But, um, so that to me was, like, I wasn't even bothered about my skin anymore. But, um, yeah, it went away for a long time. But then when I was going through a really tough time when River was about three months old and, like, I, they thought they found something in my brain, it came back, right? So it came back so when I was So three months. Dead. So three months went by. You had a, a health scare, quote unquote, and it came back. It came back, yeah. Okay, okay. So it came back with a vengeance for maybe like a couple of weeks, and then it went away again, and then I was stressed again, and it would come back, and then of course, then you know, you know, it's patterns, right? So I was like, okay, this happens when I'm stressed, mm. and I can see this clearly now, like it's it's obvious, and so to this day, like. I'm like so I, I took a shower before I did this this interview and I, I it happened. I broke out in hives because 
for the last couple of days, I've been stressed over my auntie, which is like another story. But I just, I just accept it now. I'm like, I know when I'm stressed, I break out in hives and I, I, I have to be quick with showering. So like when I got out of the shower earlier, it was like so itchy and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, it's like all over my back and everywhere. So I've noticed a pattern and to me, it's like, I'm okay with it now because I just know that like some people get stomach aches when they're stressed or some people get headaches. I get hives 100%. that are induced by water. A hundred percent. And that's so interesting. Like it, I just realized something right now. I feel like the people who get psychosomatic symptoms, like the, the non normal ones, like don't experience the quote unquote normal ones. Like I never get headaches mm. ever. Like I don't like, I think I've had maybe two my entire life. Um, I don't, I just don't, but I get other stuff. I get a laundry list of other things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So very interesting um, that you say, yeah, I don't get a headache. Instead, I'll get hives. Yeah. Um, and I want people to know that just it, it doesn't. Well, I'll ask you, Sherelle. So like you consider yourself cured of aquagenic urticaria. Do you or not? I'm I would say I'm cured from the constant. Well, I can't say I'm cured, no, because it still happens when I'm stressed. But if I manage the stress, I manage the condition, right? And so it's a tricky one. Somebody asked me this the other day on YouTube. They said, hey, are you cured now? And it's like, how do I answer that question? Like, I, I, yeah, I feel like I am. And I just, for me, the, the more important thing is that, like, I accept it when it happens now. Like, it's not a big or scary thing to me. It's just, as you said, you know, it's, I just seem to, I, I, I find that as, as a person, I get the stranger symptoms with my anxiety. Whereas some people will just get like, you know, IBS or whatever. I get this. So it, for me, it's, it's no matter what you have, if you can truly accept it, like truly accept it, that, that's the most important thing, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I would, I would say your answer is a good answer. Um, it's good because no, you're not cured. Just like somebody will never be cured of getting headaches. Right. Like we will never be cured of the human condition. No. Because that's what it is. That's what a headache is. That's what, uh, uh, you know, stress hives, which is one of the more common ones where yeah. it's not like just only with water, you just break out in hives. That's common. Stomach aches are common. Like, Somebody doesn't say, oh, I'm cured of stomach aches. Like, no, you can get a stomach ache in the future well, yeah, for various reasons. Yeah. You know, stress being one of them. Um, so very, uh, thank you for sharing. So you had your kid. He, it went away. You had a house care. It came back. And then, then okay, so at this point, did you realize, like, okay, I, it's strongly related to stress. Were you sold out on the whole psychosomatic thing or you were more like, okay, it's just related now? Yeah, so this is where I was, I was still like toying between hormones and the, the you know, the psychosomatic stuff. So I, I was kind of, um, I was torn. Um, but this was the time that I started to look into psychosomatic stuff more because I was having other symptoms you know other stuff going on that like also didn't make sense nothing as rare as um as aquagenic urticaria but I was having other stuff that was just super crazy to me like the you know the sort of symptoms that are not even on the list of like anxiety symptoms when you search it so that's when I started to look into like Joe Dispenza you know and and like his work and like all of these books and I was like wow like this is a thing, and then I just, yeah, it made sense to me in the way that it was explained scientifically. Like, I think what's happening is that when I'm stressed, it's affecting, like, my immunoglobins, and, like, for example, like, you've got, like, um, immunoglobin A, M, G, all of that, and I think that when I'm stressed, those become unbalanced, right? And, like, my, I don't know, IgG or my IgA or whatever yeah, just yeah. depletes or, I don't know, and I just think so, that's so what's what happening. What are what is IgA, IgB, hemoglobin for like the non nerds? <laughs> to be honest, like I, I don't really, I don't fully understand it like myself. But you, um, you have certain Im 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 immunoglobins essentially. There's five of them, 
and they do different things um and you need those to be like balanced right um because if they're not you can you know get various conditions so like for example uh like a condition multiple myeloma which is a like a blood cancer it's a really rare one that's essentially where you have too much igm and it like overcrowds you know and like some people with like allergies will have like high iga right um so i i don't really know that the, all of them but that was my theory is that perhaps these immunoglobins which i still don't you know they're, they're like your immune system essentially they, they regulate yeah that's all i know about them is that they are part of the immune system that's yeah same I, I mean i don't know a great deal but for me i was kind of like okay because another thing that i experience when i'm stressed is that like my immune system is really low right so i catch loads of like viral infections so i'm like right well maybe my lymphocytes are low and my you know i just think it's an immune system thing i think that when my immune system is, sp is suppressed from stress that my body in an autoimmune kind of way starts to attack things that it shouldn't so i'll give you an example so i have like hay fever and i have um like i'm, I'm also allergic to like dust right which is like a lot of people are allergic to these things but when i'm stressed my reactions are worse because when you when your immune system is suppressed in that way people will get their will find that their allergies and their intolerances are worse so like people with peanut allergies, there's been, there's been studies to show that people with peanut allergies will get noticeably more severe reactions when they're stressed. So, and that again, like if allergies, are they a mind body yeah, thing? Like that's another indication. mind thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. Clear. That's, that's clear indication of that it does affect the immune system. I think so. Uh, that's my theory from what yeah, I have yeah. read. Um, there's another theory out there for aquagenic urticaria that it's, um, that it's skin cells um reacting with the water to create like a new substance that the body is attacking i don't really i read that, that. Yeah. yeah i don't buy That's, into that uh, a little out there it is i mean doctors have to make stuff up when they well they don't have to but they oftentimes like to when they don't right when they don't know what's going on just like the dermatologist that told me oh it's your sandals your sandals are too i wore the sandals like a thousand times before with no reaction yeah. all of a sudden sometimes um, you know, so I, I want to touch on at this point in the story, you're fine. You were finding chinks in the armor. You're like, okay, when I'm stressed out, it happens. I'm guessing you did more research based on the knowledge you just shared right now about the mind body connection. Mm -hmm. Um, and you start finding chinks in the armor. So with these kinds of symptoms, you start to find chinks in the armor of like, this does not make sense. And for me, one of those was like, I would rest and I would get symptoms. Whereas before it would only happen if I did certain physical activities. And then, you know, so then I would rest and then I would get symptoms. I'm like, wait a minute, this thing has a mind of its own. You know, well, it did, it was my mind. So, um, you know, and it, it's the same thing with all these symptoms. Um, and going back to the Coca-Cola lady who like said she could drink Coca-Cola, but she can't eat watermelon and stuff. It's the same thing. Like I've seen people where they can only wear certain shoes. So certain people have foot pain. It's like, okay, if I wear these shoes, my foot doesn't hurt. But as soon as I put on the other ones, I get pain. Well, that makes no sense physically, right? So those are the chinks in the armor that start to get people to think and question what their doctors are telling them, start to question the, gen the explanations that people come up with. Like with fibromyalgia, they tell people, it's the weather, it's, it's all these different things, right? The, the barometric pressure of where you're at right now Oh, it's because you were on the airplane. I've, heard, I've seen someone like who would get bloody noses and they'll be like, oh, you need, it's the airplane when you go up and down when they never had that before. So doctors oftentimes like to make up these myths. Uh, and there's so many of them that I can go on for. I could go on for like an hour. But um, yeah, so you're fine things in the armor at this point in the story. And then, and then what happened? What did you do? At that point... I really think I just I just gave up because it was exhausting trying to figure it out and I got to a point where I was like maybe I'll never fully know what's causing this but I strongly believe that it was that it was you know psychosomatic mm -hmm. and then I just mm -hmm. I just kind of let it go um, and I just started to just um, expose myself so you know like I, I wouldn't go um, swimming before because I was too scared of what might happen 
so I started to go swimming again um and I started to you know like in the summer I would go out and and play with my daughter with the in the in the pool and just all the stuff that I had been avoiding even with like I so for the longest time I was just having showers and before this all happened I I used to my, my thing was like having baths like I'd have like literally three baths a day like two three baths a day um my poor water bill um but I used to love that and uh, I used to have like bath bombs and stuff it was like a bit of self-care for me so I just went back to that you know and I just kind of I got to a point where I was like well regardless of whether I'm in the shower for two minutes or 20 I'm still gonna get a reaction anyway so why why let it rob me of my joy you know like I, I kind of refuse to let it weigh me down anymore um okay okay and that kind of, I guess that kind of leads me to today where I just live, I don't even think about it at all, you know? Even when I do react, like I just, I guess because the fear is not there anymore. It's just like, it's, it's just like any other weird bodily sensation that you get used to over time. Oh, you know what I mean? At yeah. some point you just stop thinking about it and kind of just went on with your life it sounds like. Yeah, I did because I kind of had to because you you can only spend so much time obsessing and then you eventually you just think I can't can't keep doing it sort of thing. Especially when it's something that you can't avoid. It's not like, oh, I'm allergic to peanuts so I just won't eat them, right? It's like I can't avoid this. I have to I have to expose myself. There's there's no other option, right? And uh, you know, I I did, I was having therapy and I think going through that exposure process just showed me that actually do you know what even if this allergy doesn't go away and I have to deal with this forever I can cope with it and it was when I had that moment of like yeah I can deal with it that it just lessened you know and now if I get a reaction I probably get one every six weeks so it's like minimal um and I don't mind as such because I actually I actually see it as a valuable indicator that I need to up my game with my anxiety management, right? So it's like, oh, my body's telling me. It's like giving me a kick up the ass. Like, you know, come on, don't slack, you know? Yeah, I love that. It's a shift in perspective. Yeah. From this is bad to this is a message and it's just a message. Message, yeah. It's a message, right? And you, you respond to that message, and it's a message. It's a message, no different. Once you get to a point, it sounds crazy, like me saying this, but you do get to a point where it's like, it's no different than being hungry, or, um, you know, any other messages that our body gives us that we don't interpret as negative. Uh, however, like when it's terrible, the messaging system is broken. So when there's when there's periods of time where you're symptom free it's easier to interpret it as a message versus like if you're someone watching this and you're in chronic symptoms, pain, whatever it is, it's harder because you're like, well, how can it be a message if it's tw all the time, 24 right. seven. And that just means the messaging system is just out of whack a little bit. Um, so I do want to talk about that a little bit. So at first your symptoms, when you first had your child way back when your first child and you, um, your first shower, aquagenic urticaria happened. And was it every day after that? Every day. Every, every single day. time you showered. Every single time. And every single time I, you know, got a bit of water on myself or got caught in the rain. Yeah, every, every single day without fail. Were you like very like hyper vigilant of water? Yes. Like, did, did you see like people drinking water and you're just like, or yeah. like, you know? I was, okay. um, I was really on edge, you know, this is why I sort of was so, I would like check the weather before like going out and um, yeah, I was just like super paranoid that, I used to think, I don't know why, but I used to think what my biggest fear was that it would cause like anaphylactic shock. Um, so I was like scared to like go out on my own with the baby because I was like, what if it starts raining and I go into shock or something? Like now looking back, like I, I wish I'd, I'd never believe that thought because it restricted me from doing stuff right. But yeah, I was. I it, it definitely. Um, it definitely controlled me for a while. Hundred percent. Okay, so it was constant, and then after you had your your second child, then it stopped. 
It's not randomly, and then it came back a few a uh, few weeks later. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, was it also twenty four seven in the beginning? Um. So when it came back, when my son was about three months, um, it was it was twenty four seven for about two to three weeks, and then it went away again. So, okay, okay. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so there's chinks in the armor, kind of at that point. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then now it just happens like here and there when you're stressed out. Yeah. So it's like, I, I, for me, like it's, it's kind of like a certain type of stress as well. Like, um, like I would say that I, I'm a worrier. So I worry most days about something. Right. Um, but it's like, it has to be a couple of days back to back stress about something that's like out, out of my control. Um, and that's when it happened. So day to day kind of like overthinking and a bit of anxiety doesn't seem to trigger it. It's, I think it's when my body is like truly suppressed from a couple of days worth of high stress and anxiety. Um, I'm still learning about it, you know, and I, I imagine I'll learn more as, as uh, time passes. But yeah, it definitely seems to be a, a certain type, which is interesting to me. Yeah, according to like my current research, there, these symptoms are only going to happen if the brain truly feels like you're going to die, like you're in a life or death situation. And the day-to-day -day stuff won't do it until it accumulates to a certain point where that day-to-day -day load triggers this reaction in your psychology that's like, hey, we're going to die, we're in danger, like we can't keep going on like this. Yeah. So that's probably why in your case it will only happen after a few days because that trigger in your brain doesn't get switched off until a few days of like really yeah. stretched out uh, time periods. And I remember on your Instagram one time you posted um, – you some hives that you had and you said this is just after like running rushing around yeah uh so you were just rushing around like going about your day I'm, I'm guessing like in a very quick way which a lot of people do yeah um however I in your case and in mine the before you even get these symptoms your nervous system is already on a ramped up at a higher level than the av higher than the average person yeah and so that's why rushing around, maybe, maybe, well, maybe somebody else's point is like right here where they'll get symptoms. Yours might be down here. Right. Um, interesting. So you're at a point where you believe it's psychosomatic. You don't experience everyday symptoms. If it does happen, you're able to accept it. Walk, walk me through how you were able to break the fear of this of the symptoms happening and if they do happen of of, exp of like still taking showers still going about your day still drinking water what was that process like for you and you know i want all, everything like how difficult it was for you how scary it was all of it so for a while i tried to like forcibly accept it which never works you know so i was like oh i accept it it was still happening because um, I was still fearful. I was still really worried that I was going to go into shock. I mean, it got to the point where I had an EpiPen that I would like carry around with me and an asthma pump because I was like, what if I drink water and my throat does close or what if I have a reaction? So I used to carry an EpiPen and an asthma pump in my bag with me, which kind of showed me that you're still really scared. You know, if you're carrying an EpiPen around with you, you're still terrified. And so... I can't remember the exact moment, but there was just a time where I just, I just woke up one day and I was like, I'm tired of this. I'm, I'm really done. I'm tired of it. I actually just don't care anymore. And I had had it for like, I don't know, maybe two years at that point and nothing terrible had happened. And I just sort of just thought, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna look at my skin anymore. So I used to, when I was bad, I used to get out the shower and instantly look at my skin, I'd get, you know, I'd have the mirror and I'd be like turning around looking at my back and stuff and like the more mm. I looked at them, the more popped up, literally. I'd take photos and videos and I would be like, oh, like, is, is this like, is this the worst reaction I've had? And so I just stopped all that, which is why the dressing gown for me was like a game changer because I would get out of the bath, I'd put this big fluffy dressing gown on, tie it up to here, 
so I couldn't see or really feel anything. And then I would instantly go, distract myself, and then within half an hour, it would have come and gone, and I wasn't even, like, aware of it. So I just, I did that. That was my coping mechanism, a bit of avoidance, you know? But for me, it was, like, avoidance that I needed. I needed to go through that avoidance process to get to the point where I was no longer scared. Um, because once I did that with a dressing gown, like, now I'm at a point where I can, I could get out of the shower completely naked, and I just wouldn't even... I know that I've got hives on my body, but I'm not, like, looking in the mirror or, like, you know, contorting myself to see where they are because I know they're there. There's no point looking for them and scratching them and getting stressed because I know where that leads. So, yeah. I don't know what caused that shift, but I think for me it was just I just got fed up. You got tired of it pretty much. Yeah. 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 You kind of just get to a point where you're like, oh, fuck it, man. Like, I don't care. I want to take a shower. Yeah. I want to take a shower. I have my own beef with the shower, like, and symptoms. And I got to that point where I was like, dude, I like taking showers. Like, Yeah. Like, let me live. <laughs> yeah. Like, I love taking shower. Like, who doesn't like taking a warm shower, know. you know? Yeah. And, and when you, when you let that steal it from you, and I used to um, come out and, like, also examine my skin because my skin would react. Uh, and it was like, I just got to a point where I did the same thing. I stopped looking. And mm-hmm. I think that's so good. And it is a little bit avoidant, but sometimes you need a little bit of avoidance. There's a balance to all of this. Like, if it's one thing I've learned studying this for a long time, I used to be really more, like, like strict and stuff. Like, no, you, you need to, you can't avoid, you have to hit it head on. And um, now I understand there's a balance. Yeah. You know, you, you're, you're teaching a really nervous and scared brain to relax. And it's just like teaching a child or an animal. It, it doesn't ask for your permission and it doesn't believe you right away. Right. Like all of it, you were just so scared for the months of water and your brain's like, now you're trying to tell me it's safe? Yeah, yeah. Like you, so we were scared for seven months or a year or a year and a half and now all of a sudden it's okay? Hell no, I don't believe you. Mm-hmm. Like that's what it's going to do and it's going to resist in the form of anxiety in the form of symptoms to kind of buck up to you and be like, well, show me, show me. It's not, it's, it's okay. Show me. So if we get symptoms, you're not going to get scared and you're going to have to do it. And you're going to have to get those symptoms, take the shower, get the symptoms and, and show your brain that you're not afraid. Right. And that's breaking the fear avoidance cycle, which I'm going to make a video on soon, but it's been studied for years, the fear avoidance cycle and breaking out of it. And you don't have to, you don't have to uh, completely lose your fear in order for you to work on this. It's like, Sherelle, the first time you, you started to like uh, kind of say, fuck it, I'm just going to shower. Were you scared still? I think the first like, couple you... of times, yeah. Yeah, I was still scared. But the more I did it, you know, that's exactly what happened. The more I did it and was okay and had proof that I was okay, which is more evidence in my favor for me to kind of say to my brain, see... It's okay. Yes, we itch and yes, we have hives, but we're not dying, you know. We don't have to avoid showering, you know, because there was people on the group that were like, you know, I'm only showering once a week and some people weren't showering at all and they were just basically like buying these like crazy creams and like I'm a very clean person. Like I, that, that was never a, I remember people saying to me and actually the uh, immunologist said to me like, maybe you need to reduce your showers. I was like, no, that's <laughs> not no. an option. <laughs> that's not an option that's not happening like I went from bathing three times a day like I'm not about to like shower once a week like no that was so that was never a thing for me but a lot of people on the group were having like you know one to two showers a week like the bare minimum and with, because at the time when your immunologist told you this um you saying no was that purely like just from vanity and like um, your ego not wanting to accept that or were you already kind of like in a place where you were standing up to the symptoms by that point? No, it was purely vanity, 100%. Okay. Yeah. So it helped you in this case. It did. Case. Like your because ego like, and your yeah. vanity. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I was like, I'm not about to let this condition like take away my, I don't know, my cleanliness you know my yes. personal hygiene like I was like no yes. that's a no that's a no-brainer and that I think that really helped actually because I was just like that was a firm no um and I think that really helped because other people 
on the group were like, you know, they were listening to that advice and doing it and being really depressed about it. And they were like, oh, you know, I have to wait until Friday to shower. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not falling in that trap. So good. Yeah, so good. It helped you. And you need that. You need that like bravado. You need that ego to get you through some of these symptoms. You do. And it needs you know? to be like, no. Yeah. yeah. There were people, I remember when I did the newspaper article and like you get trolls, of course, and people were like, um, oh, I bet she like smells so bad. Cause I, bet, I was like, I bet I smell better than you times 10. You know? <laughs> like, because like people were trying to like troll me and stuff. And I was just like, you know, that happens, isn't it? You know, I, and because I came out, a lot of people thought I was lying as well. There was a lot of people like, oh, she's just trying to get famous and she's just trying to, and I will say that I was never paid for any of the interviews that I did. I didn't want payment. I didn't want any payment. I was just trying to like raise awareness. So I didn't get paid a single pound for any of it. But there were people, um, you know, just kind of thinking that I was making up this really elaborate story, um, which is just absurd because I don't know why anyone would want to do that. But yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, those are all the things that people hear, though, when they're in pain. Yeah. Like if, if you... There's a, a real lack of empathy um, in the... in for people with chronic illness. Yeah. And, um, you know, Arlene Feinblatt, she has an interview. She worked with Dr. Sarno. She was a psychologist, uh, the head psychologist that worked with him that developed a lot of these theories. They were diving into the unconscious mind too. And she would talk about the patients at the Rusk, Medic Rusk Medical uh, Center in New York where, like, these doctors, like, scoffed at them mm -hmm. because these people were coming in in wheelchairs and you couldn't see anything wrong with them. Right. You know, and to the outside, you look normal, you know? And I'm sure you had people telling you that, like, you look fine. I, yeah. There's actually a page that a girl has on YouTube called You Look Fine, and it's about chronic illness. Um, that's how often people are told that. Oh, you look okay. I was told that, too. Oh, you're young. You look fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. And, yeah. you know, thankfully, it is true. There is nothing wrong with you, but you're in pain. You're in a lot of suffering, and the pain is real, and there is something wrong when you're in pain. Right. It ruins things, um, you know? So it's amazing that you had the bravado and you kept that ego <laughs> and you, you kept you kept it. And, it, you know, for people who are about to go on disability too and they're like, heck no, I'm not getting on disability. Like, I'm not getting on disability. Like, no, 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 no. You know, that ego can really take you a long way if oh, you really target it. Targeted. Yeah, it can take you far if you keep that. Um, you need it. And if you don't have it, you need it if you're watching this. You do. Whatever I, it, you do. Yeah, I big myself up every day. It's hilarious. You know, I, my, a big part of my recovery, not just from the aspergenic ear scary, but from the anxiety, was that I woke up one day and I looked in the mirror and I was like, you are a badass bitch. Like, we're not doing this anymore, you know? <laughs> like, having that mentality of like, that ego, um, it just really helped me, you know, because I, what anxiety did to me was just made me like a, a shell of my former self, right? And I just, once I got that ego back, um, it just allowed me to think like, we're not doing this. No, this is not my life. Like, I'm not gonna live like this. I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and cry every day. We're gonna, we're gonna move, you know, and I still do yes. that to this day, every day. You know, look myself in the mirror. And I'm like, you're an amazing person. This is what we're going to do. Yes. You know? And I, and I just think we don't praise it ourselves enough. We praise other people. We don't praise ourselves. And we really need to do more of it. A hundred percent. If you're suffering with chronic pain, you're like a real life superhero to me. hundred percent, yeah. Because our chronic symptoms, chronic illness, anything. Like, because day to day, it's like, you got to give yourself credit for just surviving sometimes. Yeah. Because that's how bad it can be. That's how bad it can be that just to make it through a day, like you just gotta praise yourself and cheer yourself on, especially if you're not getting it elsewhere. Because, and you know, people, I mean, I just think about people were make, making like comments saying you smell, like what the fuck? <laughs> like, what, where do these demons come from? I'm sorry, like, I don't, it's, it's, it's beyond me, like, to make fun of somebody. To their face, too. I know. I can get, like, side jokes or, oh, she must smell, like, to, to themselves. But they were telling you this? Yeah, just, like, it was, like, on my, like, YouTube channel and stuff. And it was just, like, 
just insane. Yeah. Insane. I see, and I, I see you got the fire because I see people leave comments on your Instagram, and you're like, boom, like you just <laughs> smack them in the face with a comment. Like I, I see the sure. comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very funny, like, very funny. <laughs> if you guys go on her Instagram, you'll see them because people are so rude. Yeah. They, she, so she has, yeah. So like she has an uh, Sherelle has an Instagram where she talks about health anxiety and people leave like these nasty comments, like, oh, it's not a real thing. It's you know, it's just take a Xanax. Like I've seen <laughs> that one. Yeah. I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. Like, dude. So you need the ego because if you didn't have it, you would let those comments crush you. And they did for a time. I remember, you know, when my when my anxiety was really bad, I used to take them really personally. But now I'm just like, oh, no, go away. I don't need to deal with you. Like, you know? Yeah. Because um, there, there are, you know, it's, it's, it's not just me. It's like I've seen other people that talk about psychosomatic illness and health anxiety. And people just don't, there are people who just don't buy it, you know, and they just leave in these comments like, oh, you just need to, you know, like you said, just take some medication or whatever. And it's like, it, it's so, it annoys me so much that I can't. And like, you know, Joe will say, just don't even respond to them. And I'm like, I can't help it. I, I just can't. I have to like give them like the, the verbal attack. Be in your own corner, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like if they're saying something, like you can say, you're not hurting them by saying anything back. Exactly. You know? So yeah. I love it. I love it. I want to go back to um, earlier in the story, in your story. By the way, like, it's been incredible so far. Uh, there were some things that I noticed. So before you had the aquagenic urticaria, did you, were you already, you said you were already like an anxious type of personality. Did you experience any psych- psychos? If, if that's true, did you experience any symptoms before that? Yeah. So this is what's going to get a little bit deep. Do you want me to get deep? Get deep. Okay. So I went through something really unfortunate when I was five, right? So um, I'm an only child. And me, my mum and my dad, we um, used to live opposite my nan and my granddad on my on my mum's side, right? And so I used to go like literally back and forth my nan's house and my mum's house because my, my nan was literally like my second mum. And my my granddad, we didn't know it then. This was like over twenty years ago. But he he was um, he had something called pathological jealousy, which is a really rare condition um, that um, mostly, well, exclusively affects men. And it's essentially like a schizophrenia almost, but it's like a, a delusion that your spouse is having an affair. But it comes with psychosis, right? So it's not just like being a bit paranoid. It's like a real thing. Um, and so without getting into the story too much, but essentially I was over my nan and my granddad's house. They were arguing. So I got sent home and then the phone rang like five minutes later and it's my granddad. He's hysterical. And he's like, you need to come over here. And when we went over there, he had murdered her and I saw it and I was five. Right. So as you imagine a five year old seeing your nan on the floor, covered in blood, there was blood everywhere. He had also cut his throat so his throat was essentially hanging open so my mum faints right so I'm here five with my nan dead on the floor my mum who has fainted and my granddad whose throat is hanging out right so as you can imagine from then on I was very fucked up understandably so I grew up fearing everything because I had seen the worst case scenario like it wasn't like it wasn't it was just all in the newspaper it was like a big thing right so I grew up with a ton of symptoms and issues because I could not grasp the concept of life. I was like, life is evil. I can't trust anyone. Bad things happen, you know? And so from like age six, you know, I would have like, um, gosh, like I remember having tingling and crawling sensation in my skin. I developed severe OCD. I had a ton of therapy, um, years and years of therapy. And then when I was like in In my childhood, yeah, oh, all Years of therapy childhood. and childhood. Okay. Yeah, all through childhood, up until, well, on and off. And in my teen years, I then became convinced that I was, like, a mass murderer or that I was going to do this, like, really intrusive thoughts that I believed. Um, so these thoughts were telling you that you were a murderer? Yeah, yeah, because I was like, what, what, I was like, what if I murder someone? What if I, what if I hurt a child? What I if see. I do this? And so... Yeah. It's, it was those intrusive thoughts that I started to really believe. Um, so that was a really tough time for me. And then between the age of like 
19 and 23, I was okay. And I was doing really good and I was out and I was dating boys and I was like drinking, loving life, partying. Um, and it was, yeah, around about the age 24-ish then and things started to dip a little bit. And then, you know, when I was 25 was when I got pregnant and then that whole health anxiety, aquagenic urticaria stuff like came about. So yeah, my I don't like to tell my story too much because everybody have suffered like everyone's gone through stuff but I do think it's a huge part of like my anxiety because I think when you see something at such a vulnerable and innocent age something that horrific like it's bound to change you and shape you as a person you know of course yeah I can't even I mean that's it's rough it's gonna affect the child yeah it's gonna affect you when you see anything like that yeah and when you're exposed to like how bad things happen that's like it in the world they bad things happen in the world um some people see it earlier some people see it later on in life yeah but eventually you get you it mostly everybody sees it unless you live under a rock yeah um and that will make you question yourself too as far as like the thoughts, like, okay, well, if this person can do it, then like, what am I capable of? I used to think that it maybe was like genetic as well. And it was like going to run in the family and like, well, you know, he had it. And so why can't I? And I would say he's also still alive. He's in his seventies. He's now in a new relationship, which is like insane. Cause she knows that he killed his ex-wife and I don't know how I feel about that, but. <sighs> Like, Test. hello, I, yeah, it's crazy. But um, he, um, after that, he obviously was, well, he wasn't put in jail. He was put in like a, like a mental, like a mental injury. Because he, like he, the, the trial was that like he was guilty, but through diminished responsibility, which is essentially meaning that like he wasn't sane. Um, so yeah, I just used to really believe that like if he could snap and do something like that, like what am I capable of, you know? And that was just all intrusive thoughts, of course. Um, Right, it's a lie. Yeah, and it, I, I also found it like when my when my daughter was born, for example, I was like terrified of anything happening to her, and I didn't want anyone near her, didn't want anyone. I was like scared of germs, and then I and then I used to get intrusive thoughts of like, what if I hurt her? What if like so I became the threat then, you know? And that was like postnatal depression, and yeah, it's just a really. I just think when you go through something at such a young age, I just think your brain wires in a really morbid kind of way and I think that's just why for years everything was just what if this what if that catastrophic thinking because I'd seen literally the worst case scenario so it was hard for me you know and, and still hard for me like you know when people say like oh that won't happen and I'm like well I've had two crazy things happen in my life a crazy allergy and a crazy situation so it's kind of like it's it's really hard to, to when the, for those words to comfort you when you've like seen the worst you know what I mean so yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, it's crazy, you know, but as I said, I try not to delve into that too much because I think everybody has a story, you know, and I don't like to compare and be like, oh, I'm worse off because, you know, of this. Yeah, no, everybody, I mean, everybody has a story, but it's a story. It doesn't make it any less yeah. valid. Yeah. Um, and yeah, once you get that first scar, it's like, it's harder for you to be positive again. It is. Because when people tell you things like, oh, it's, it's going to be all right, you're like, oh, well, I know the time it wasn't all right, you know? And that's a very common thing, not only with life events, but even with, like, the symptoms. I had many people tell me, oh, you're going to be okay. Yeah. And I believed it for a year. And then after a year, I'm like, I'm not okay yet. What the fuck? A year and a half, still, you know, experiencing symptoms. It's like, don't lie to me. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. lie to me. Don't tell me it's going to be okay. And that's the mindset that you're in. Not that it's correct, but that is like what happens when you've gone through something and your your brain becomes pretty much attuned to bad things. It bad does. things happen. Bad things are going to happen. They're going to happen to me. I, I've already had something really rare happen, so something else can happen that's really rare, you know? And it's hard for you to be rational then at that point. Right. Uh, so it's interesting to see like how it, it ties into like the onset of your symptoms, even with the health anxiety, because it's like you saw something that's rare. You know, that doesn't happen to a lot of people. What happened, happened. You, what, you, what happened to you when you were a child? 
And so then it's now it's like, okay, well, what else can happen? You know, well, one in a million people have this health issue or whatever. In your mind, you're probably like, well, probably like one in a million people have seen what I've seen. Yeah. Um, so, wow. I mean, thank you for sharing. And it also proves how pe- people oftentimes think that these symptoms happen out of nowhere. Like, oh, I just had this water allergy and boom, it just happened right after I gave birth. So you're focused on that one thing. Okay, birth, water allergy. But look at all this other stuff before. Yep. Right? All of these mental things, all of these symptoms that you had before, they just weren't like probably enough to get your attention the way that the water allergy did. Yeah. Um, and that's the function of these symptoms. They're going to get more intense until you listen they will not be denied like that's the one thing and that's why acceptance is so important because you're not going to deny these symptoms away you're going to have to face them Mm -hmm. and they will be heard (laughs) like they will be heard and when they're heard they will start to calm down yeah so very interesting like to see how your your symptoms were not just random they happened before um now, what, during this, like, whole process after the, actually, no, the whole time, like, once you, once you kind of realize, okay, this is all connected, my mental health, my symptoms, were you a little bit upset that, like, growing up with all these symptoms and even with the water allergy that, like, none of the, well, I'm assuming none of the doctors told you, I don't know if any of them did, but let's say they didn't, were you a little bit upset that nobody told you? Um, nobody maybe put you in a better form of therapy that could have helped you a little bit more? Yeah, I guess so a little bit because, but then, I don't know, I mean, when this all started for me, this was like going back like, like I'm 30 this year, so it was going back like 25 years ago, you know, so I understand that back then, you know, but yeah, I mean, when I, especially with the with the water allergy, especially I was frustrated very frustrated because especially with my GP because I was like what do you mean that like, and I don't want to trigger people here in the sense of like I don't think GPs are useless but with the rare chronic somatic oh yeah let's of, talk about it let's yeah, talk about like, it yeah yeah they, they they just you know they they're only trained for certain stuff and they kind of when they get to that point where they're like I don't know what's what's going on uh with this person they just kind of leave you then um I wish that there was like a clinic for like psychosomatic stuff or at least suspected psychosomatic stuff where people could go. It's coming in they... the US. Oh, re- oh, see, I'm jealous. We don't have yeah. that yet. Yeah, but continue. So you wish there was like something like that? Yeah, just something where, you know, if you've exhausted all options and nothing is showing up on any of your scans or tests, that you can go and, and get some management and, and get some therapy and stuff. You know, we do have, I mean... Here in the UK, there is um, a big emphasis at the moment on like functional neurological disease, which a lot of people are diagnosed with when they have like strange neurological symptoms. And I know that there is uh, some kind of therapy for that. But yeah, I mean, I just wish there was more of that because I think that would be, um, I just think that would be helpful to people. Yeah, it definitely is like if I had like a millions of dollars, I would definitely be doing it now. I would be setting it up. I would have the hospital. Um, yeah. but it is, there is one, they're opening in Las Vegas out here in Nevada. I believe it's going to be the therapist, Christy Weepy and Dr. Howard Schubiner. They're going to run in. They're actually partnering with Anthem, which is a huge insurance company here in the U S it should be really exciting. So they're going to go. And like, the goal is for like in one day, like, Oh my God, this will save me years of, of suffering in one day. You'll get your scans. You'll see the doctor, probably Dr. Schubiner and his other people he's trained. And those consultations are like two hours with Dr. Schubert, three hours. That's how long his consultations are. You get your scans, they get interpreted, and that day, like, they try and get you on a plan. So regardless of what your diagnosis is, if you get diagnosed with TMS or PPD, psychophysiologic disorder, then they're, you're going to get into a therapy plan or some, something of that sort to address your psychology. So great idea. It's coming. People have thought of it. We, we're going to need more. Big ups to Anthem, though, for doing that, the insurance company. Like, huge ups. And for, like, insurance companies, they are going to save so much money 
because there's so much money wasted on surgeries, on treatments, yeah. on, I mean, how much, would you mind sharing, Sherelle, and with your issues, like how much money you've paid privately to, 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 to like thousands. figure out what's going on? Oh, thousands probably, yeah. Thousands. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And of course you would, because there's, you want to figure out what's wrong. Right, like, you're desperate, aren't you, know, you in that moment? Yeah. It's, it's, your health is, there's no price for your health. You'll pay anything, you'll do anything. Like, if I had a daughter or a, a son that was ill, I would pay anything, do anything Close. to, like, find out what's wrong with them and get the treatment, right? So, um, yeah, great idea. I also wanted to talk about um, the, the kind of, like, the fame, the whole, like, fame aspect of this um, water allergy. And you also mentioned that it was a mistake to kind of like spread awareness and stuff. I want you to really talk about that because why would, why would it be a mistake to spread awareness for something? <clears throat> well, I think the mistake was going to the newspapers. Um, I just felt like that was the easiest route to get the story out there. Um, but it really blew up. So like I remember like writing to the, to the, the Daily Mail and I didn't get a response. They didn't say they were going to publish a story or anything. And I just kind of forgot about it. And then literally two days later, my phone blew up because it was everywhere in all newspapers, front page, like girl allergic to water. And, you know, I had journalists ringing me all the time, like agents ringing me, like we want to do this, wow. we want to do that. You know, we wanted to go on this show and that show and this magazine. And it really became very overwhelming. Um, because I, yes, I wanted to raise awareness. And I am a very outgoing, bubbly person, but I also did feel a bit vulnerable with it. Um, so I did a couple of things. I did like a Barcroft interview, like documentary type thing. Which, which I've good. seen. Yeah. It has 2 million views now. Do you know that? I, I, I've i never looked at it. I don't look at the comments. Has... Yeah. Okay, I don't... good. You shouldn't. But it has 2 million has views. Million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just... um. I have never watched that video, at, like the full thing either, just because um, I just never wanted to. But yeah, burn um, it with fire and delete it off the internet. Like, like yeah, we should get it deleted. Yeah. So um, yeah, it just a lot of the stuff that I said got misinterpreted, and that annoyed me a little bit. Um, so that was a mistake. But raising awareness for it, I don't think was. It was just kind of the route that I went down. I okay. wish maybe I had just made my own YouTube videos where I spoke out rather than like relying on somebody else to relay my words, which was just never going to end well. You know, I should have known that, but I didn't. That's interesting. So, yeah. Did they kind of like paraphrase instead of quote you correctly? <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of paraphrasing. What a mess. Yeah. And not only was it a lot of paraphrasing, but when I was having the interview done, they would like say to me like, oh, so, so this happened, right? And I'd be like, no. And they'd be like, oh, so it was it. And they just would like back me into a corner where I ended up feeling like I wasn't, I wasn't even being genuine to myself because it was like a lot of pressure to make this story big and shocking and whatever. And like what I was actually trying to get across was that like, yes, I have this condition, but I don't think it is as bad, no, not as bad, I don't think it is accurate as some of the other stories that we've seen in the newspaper thus far. You know, so I was kind of trying to come out with like a new concept and a new viewpoint, but they didn't. They just used the old viewpoint and just dragged me into the mess, you know? Yeah. Oh my goodness. And how many of those people have reached out to you since, like to see how you're doing? Hmm. What you mean? Like other people, other sufferers or? N no, the um, networks, um, networks that were hitting you up, the newspapers, none. all that. Have they contacted Barcraft? Nothing? No. They're not interested. They just wow. want to, they just want to get the story out it I don't think they were ever interested in like me as a person um yeah nothing I didn't hear anything yeah that's kind of my beef with these channels like Barcroft is like are they really helping no or are they just making circus m monkeys out of these people that are suffering I mean it sounds terrible but it feels that way though doesn't it, it, it really because... pisses me off kind of yeah yeah yeah, yeah. interesting yeah well well, now we're spreading awareness with this stuff and, you know, to save people years of suffering that they don't have to go through, hopefully, if they can get to a center like you talked about, right, um, where they, you know, 
where they just send people right away. And not the Mayo Clinic, because the Mayo Clinic is not that. It's not. Um, something where people are actually trauma-informed, you know, they're aware of the unconscious mind. They've, they're experienced, like Dr. Schubiner, um, because he's seen, that, like at this point, like thousands of patients who have psychosomatic issues. Uh, because I know I was mad, so that's why I asked you. I was mad at, at the medical system, at everything. Because how is it that I can't, like I found something on Google that my fucking doctor didn't know. It's like insane. Like this is your job. Like you get paid to do this, you know? And I also, I didn't experience this in therapy, but I also have my beef with that too, because it's like, why this needs to be taught to therapists? And it's not, um, you know? And years of suffering can be saved. You know, of course I've moved through it. I'm not like a bitter, angry person, um, but something needs to be done or there's gonna keep being more stories like yours, like mine, and many other people are suffering for no reason, pretty much. Um, so, man, it, it was this was an excellent, excellent interview. Um, thank you for coming on. For anybody who wants to learn more about like the um, Sherelle's story, you can go on her YouTube. She has videos about her water allergy. I believe she shares pictures of like when she went to the doctors and she was diagnosed. Um, I'll, I'm also gonna link the Barcraft interview. Barcroft, sorry, they changed the name to Truly now. So I'll link that in the description box for, for uh, people who want to see that video. It's about 20 minutes long. Um, she's still the same bubbly person that she is, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, she's not. Just watch that and know that she's now swimming in pools. She goes in the, into the swimming pool. She takes showers whenever she wants to. She doesn't fear progression of the illness because it's a message that her body gives her that she is overloaded and um, she needs to address her psychology when, when these things happen, when she gets these symptoms. So thank you for coming on. Like, it was amazing. I want to shout out to her fiance, Joe, for <laughs> setting up a camera, microphone, everything, doing a lot of the technical work on her end. Thank you, Joe. And before we go, Sherelle, is there anything you want to share with anybody? Um, you know, feel free to plug in your business or anything. No, I guess I just want to say that, like, to anybody who's, like, suffering with anything, you know, any kind of weird, rare illness, whether it's psychosomatic or not, um, I just think that it's important to, to be encouraged that I think that everything can get better, you know, even physical illnesses. I believe that the power of the mind is, like, gosh, beyond powerful, and I think it's something that we'll learn more about as time goes on. Um, and I know that it can feel so terrifying when you're in a state of fear and you're living in a state of fear constantly. I did that for years. Um, but yeah, I just want to say that things can absolutely and will get better. It's just you, you do have to kind of work on acceptance and, and that's a long process, but it's doable, you know, and I just want to, that's what I want to em emphasize, I suppose, on this whole interview that we've done is that like acceptance is key and it's possible and you can recover from things. And it's important to know that because when you look online or you speak to your doctor, it's it's all very morbid and it's like, there's no cure for this. And so you just, you feel, you feel lost, but there is, there's always hope, always. Agreed, agreed. And you're a great example of that. And you keep working, like you keep working on your mental health. You stay on top of it um, because it's, a never ending thing. We're always going to have to take care of our mental health. We're always going to have to deal with the stuff that from the past and, and address these things. Um, so, and you're, you're just a great example of it. I love your YouTube channel. Um, because all of the symptoms, like there's so many symptoms that you talk about on there that are seemingly like physical, you know, like shoddy blood test. Your bloods were off. Your markers are, are were wobbly, you know, because of anxiety. Anxiety affects, like, every cell in the body. Um, and you're helping people get better. You really are. Um, so, yeah, and I'll, I'll plug her for any, for because she didn't plug herself. She does one-on-one -on -one coaching. It's very affordable. Um, she gets great results. She gets people all the time that don't have, that don't need her anymore, which is the goal of any good coaching or, or therapy. Um, 
So if you want coaching for health anxiety, uh, and honestly, I just I think you're you can just help someone with just regular anxiety. Um, but if you need coaching, um, you can go on our YouTube and find out more about that. Uh, other than that, thank you so much, Rob, for the interview. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah.